Last Sunday morning, we began a three-part study entitled, The Sinless Son of God. Five times in the New Testament, we are specifically told that Jesus committed absolutely no sin whatsoever. And one of those times is found in Hebrews 4, verse 15. The Apostle Paul writes, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points, tempted like as we are, now note, yet without sin. Wow. From the very day he was born into this world, until the very day that he exited this world, our Lord never committed one transgression of the Word of God. Unbelievable, is it not? Jesus was accused of crimes, misdemeanors, and sins on numerous occasions, but never once was he ever convicted of sin or a crime. We noted in last week's lesson his mode of overcoming sin was not miraculous in nature. He overcame sin by his knowledge and application and use of the precious word of the living God. It is written, he said. Whatever the Father commanded Jesus Christ to do, he did. Now here's what's interesting. Anytime his will conflicted with the will of the Heavenly Father, he always, always, always yielded his will to the will of God. My friends, our Lord has given us the means of conquering sin and of serving our God faithfully. Even though all of those things that we have just mentioned are true, are taught in Scripture, there are still individuals, even to this very day, who accuse Jesus of committing all kinds of sin and crimes and violations against the God of heaven and even against humanity itself. In our lesson today, we're going to be looking at some of those accusations. Some of those examples that individuals give wherein they accuse our Lord of having committed transgressions. The title of our lesson is very simply this. The Sinless Son of God, Part 2. Next week we'll have The Sinless Son of God, Part 3. Let's begin by noticing one of the places wherein individuals accuse Jesus of sin, and that's in the cleansing of the temple. Two times during the course of our Lord's ministry, He entered into the city of Jerusalem, He entered into the temple area, and He cleansed the temple. In other words, He saw things that were going on there that were not right, that were not proper, and He drove individuals out both at the beginning of his ministry in John, the second chapter, and at the close of his ministry in Matthew, the 21st chapter. When some individuals look at Jesus, see his actions that he involved himself in on that occasion, they believe that Jesus committed sin. And his actions were somewhat extreme, were they not? We read about them in John 2, 15 and 16. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. And did what? He poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Let me ask you this. If you had been a Jew on that occasion, gathering there in the temple, would Jesus' actions have caused you some concern? Here you are just going about your normal, everyday affairs, and all of a sudden, 
There's this man out of nowhere, cracking a whip, running people out of the temple, overthrowing tables, pouring out money all over the place, telling everybody, get out of this temple. I don't know about you, I think I might have got a little nervous. There is no doubt Jesus was angry on that occasion. He was angry. And individuals look at his display of anger and they say, see there, that is sinful in nature. If anybody else had done that, we would have accused them of sin. But not only do they accuse him of that, oh yes, the sin of anger and rage, but they also accuse him of the sin of failing to abide by the laws of men. They also say that on this particular occasion, he even committed the sin of assault and battery upon his fellow human beings. While I was studying for this lesson, I came across a website where an individual just really rails on Jesus about all the sins and all the iniquities that he committed. And he has a quote about this particular occasion, and I thought it was interesting. So instead of being obedient to the governing laws or reporting the thieves to the proper authorities, Jesus decides to become a thug and invoke his own sort of mob or own sort of vigilante mob justice and begin to assault these men and scourge them, beat them up with a painful corded whip. What a hypocrite. Now that's a direct quote. So here's an individual who says Jesus didn't abide by the laws of men. He assaulted those individuals on that particular occasion. He should have gone to the authorities and just taking authority upon himself. He's charging Jesus with doing all kinds of sins, is he not? Wow. Wow. Let's talk about the reaction of Jesus. There's seven points that we're going to make. Woo, that's a long sermon, isn't it? That's only the first point. But that's what Bill always accuses me of. Three points with ten points under every point. Number one, folks, these men that were in this temple on this particular occasion were committing sin in the manner in which they were doing business. It was time of sacrifice. It was time of one of the celebrations of the Jews. And these individuals were selling animals for sacrifice. They were exchanging money from one currency to another. And in so doing, they were robbing other individuals. And they were extorting individuals on that particular occasion. These individuals were high-handed sinners and doing it right in the very holy place of the Almighty God. And Jesus accused them of their sins, did He not? Notice, take these things hence. Make not my Father's house a house of what? Merchandise. John 2 verse 16. They had changed the holy purpose of the temple into something that it was not to be used for. The second time that he cleansed the temple, he says this, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Wow, Matthew chapter 21 verse 13. You see, here is the holy place of God, the dwelling place of God. And in the very midst of that place was sin and iniquity and transgression of the will of God. What those men doing, and we need to keep it in mind. See, all the focus is placed upon who? All the focus has been placed upon Jesus by these people talking about the committing of sin. The sin was being committed by the people who were in that temple on that particular occasion. Notice secondly, if these individuals were conducting business in the temple, then the things that they were engaging in had already been approved by the religious authorities of the day. 
Folks, listen to me. You didn't go set up shop in the temple without checking with the high priest. You know that? You didn't go set up a table and start selling animals for sacrifice and exchanging money just anywhere. That had to be permitted. There had to be individuals who allowed you to do that kind of business in the temple. And guess who it was? It was the religious authorities of the day. They knew those men were there. They knew exactly what those men were doing. And most likely, they were getting their cut. So here's the point. It would have been useless for Jesus to have gone to the higher officials and talked to them about this misconduct in the temple, they knew it was going on. They knew exactly what was happening. They would already put their stamp of approval on the actions of these individuals. You don't think Jesus knew that? Oh yeah, He knew that. Third, the expression of anger is not necessarily a sin. Oh yes, some anger is sin. And Paul talks about it in Ephesians 4 verse 31. Notice that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Notice that little word anger is in there, isn't it? There is some anger that is sin. But not all anger is sinful. And I find it interesting that in that same chapter, Ephesians 4 verse 26, Paul made that abundantly clear. Be angry and what? And sin not. I can be upset, I can be agitated, I can manifest that and still not be in sin. On that particular occasion, Jesus was manifesting a righteous indignation toward the transgressions that were happening in the very house of the living God. And He was righteous in His display of anger on that particular occasion. How about this next point? There is a law that is higher than man's law. Well, I wish that there were some way that we as Christians could understand that. If our nation makes a law, we act like that is the law. That's not true, folks. There is a law that is higher than man's law. And that law is the law of the Almighty God. And it is found in the pages of the good book. Now note this next statement. When we allow something sinful to happen, that does, when man allows something sinful to happen, it doesn't mean that it's right and that you and I need to follow it. We need to be approving of it. We need to say, oh, well, that's man's law. Oh, absolutely not. Just because it's man's law doesn't mean it's God's law. We've got to understand that. There are two laws at work in this world. And on that particular occasion, even though it may have been man's law for them to be in that temple, to sell those things, to extort from their brethren, that was not God's law. God said, my house is to be what? A house of prayer. It is not made to be a den of thieves. How about this next point? The Bible nowhere tells us that Jesus whipped anyone with that cord. Not anyone. Whips back then and even whips today were made in order to corral or to drive out animals most of the time. And guess what? They are very seldom used even on animals. Did you know that? Just the action of the individual in the cracking of the whip and the sound of that whip popping causes those animals and human beings to react 
in certain ways. The only thing Jesus wanted to do is to drive them out. It is never said in the biblical text that Jesus touched one human being with a whip. The man who accused him of that while ago injected that in the text because he wanted it to be there. It's an assumption. And we don't base Bible teaching on assumption, do we? All I can tell you is he made a whip and he drove them out. You can't find one verse that says he touched them and hit them with that whip. Sixth, how about this one? Jesus was God on earth, was he not? I don't know about you, that's enough for me. If there's anybody who ought to know what ought to be done in the temple, if there's anybody who ought to know how to follow the laws of God and the laws of men, guess who it is? Jesus, the Son of God. And what he saw made him angry, didn't it? The Bible tells us this, that his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. What the divine Son of God saw struck a nerve deep down within him. And immediately he sprang forth in anger to cleanse the holy temple of the Almighty God of the sin that was being committed there. And he did so as the divine Son of the living God. Don't tell me he was wrong. Another point that's interesting is this. He did exactly what had been prophesied he would do in the Old Testament. The verse is found in Psalm 69, 9. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the disciples applied that verse to this particular occasion. The point is this. The heavenly Father knew hundreds of years before it happened that it was going to happen. Do you think that he prophesied that his holy son would sin in the temple of God? Absolutely not. There was no sin. There was righteous indignation on display on that particular occasion. How about this one? Healing on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was supposed to be a day of rest for the Jews, was it not? Notice the command. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is what? Is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Look at what he says. In it thou shalt do what? Thou shalt not do any work. None whatsoever. Question. Was the Lord strict about the Sabbath? I know it was. You remember that man who was picking up sticks? The Sabbath day command had been given. The Sabbath day rolls around. All of a sudden, they go out of their tents and they find this man just picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Ooh, look at you. You're working on the Sabbath, picking up sticks. I don't know if he's trying to make his tent area look better. Maybe he was collecting sticks for a fire for his kids who are freezing. Maybe he needed to cook some food that morning. I don't know why he was picking up sticks. All I know, he was picking up sticks. And people immediately accused him of what? Of laboring and working on the Sabbath. They grabbed that man, they threw him in hold, and they went to the Lord with the situation. And the Lord said unto Moses, This man shall surely be put to death. Man. And the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Don't tell me the Lord wasn't strict about the Sabbath day. Don't you go picking up no stick. Sticks and stones... We'll break your bones. As far as this one is concerned, isn't it? Folks, the Jews were just as strict about Sabbath keeping as was the Lord. In fact, even more so. 
Do you know that? One of the reasons for that was because they had not kept the Sabbath prior to the Babylonian captivity. And that was one of the reasons God brought them into captivity. And then for 70 years, because they were in a foreign land, they could not observe the Sabbath day the way it should be observed. Therefore, when they returned to their homeland, Sabbath keeping became important. Seven miracles that Jesus did were done on the Sabbath. Did you know that? Most of us know about one or two. Seven miracles. We have about 34 miracles recorded that Jesus did as far as individual miracles. Seven of them on the Sabbath day. The man with an unclean spirit. Mark chapter 1, done on the Sabbath day. As soon as he did that, he left and he went into Simon Peter's house. And guess who he saw? He saw... Simon's mother-in-law with a fever and he healed her on that same Sabbath day. Man. The man with the withered hand was healed on the Sabbath day. The woman with the infirmity healed on the Sabbath day. A man with dropsy healed on the Sabbath day. Not long ago we talked about that man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda. Guess what? Healed on the Sabbath day. We turn to John the ninth chapter and guess what? Another man, a blind man, healed on the Sabbath day. Seven times Jesus heals on the Sabbath. On at least four of those occasions, guess who was there? The religious leaders. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They're, they're right there watching Jesus. They see somebody that's ill brought to him. Oh boy, what's he going to do? Is he going to heal these guys? On at least two occasions, they immediately talk to the Christ about what he's done. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Boy, you need to highlight that little word indignation there. This dude is in a rage. He is been out of shape. Because that what? Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said unto the people, There are six days in which men should work. In them therefore, come and be healed, but not on the Sabbath day. Man, here's a religious leader, a ruler of the synagogue. And he says, it is sinful to heal on the Sabbath. That means Jesus sinned at least what? Seven times. We go to John the ninth chapter. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. I mean, they blatantly told everyone, there's no way this man can be the Son of God because he's healed on the Sabbath. So how do you answer that? Well, I don't have to answer that. You want to know why? Because Jesus did. Jesus confronted these individuals when they confronted Him. And He let them know real clearly about this healing on the Sabbath day. The first thing He does, He asks them a question. And the question was very simple. Were acts of mercy forbidden on the Sabbath day? Man. Notice what he says. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To what? To save life or to kill? What I love is that next part. But they held their peace. You see, when you get a question you can't answer, you just shut up. That's exactly what they did. Is it okay to perform an act of mercy on the Sabbath day? You mean to tell me I cannot do good on the Sabbath? That's the question. And guess what the Jews did? 
They sat there in absolute silence. The second thing that he does, he points out the hypocrisy of these religious leaders. Notice what he says. The Lord then answered them and said, Thou hypocrite. Boy, you can't get more powerful than that. Thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose an ox or an ass from his stall and what? Lead him away to watering? Uh oh, you little workaholics. Every one of them. Get up early in the morning, unleash their ox, unleash their donkey. Take it out to make certain he gets the water that he needs. Bring him back in. Hook him all up. Here's his point. If it's okay for you to loose that animal in order to take care of his needs, why is it wrong for me to loose a human being of his infirmities, of sickness, and of disease? You hypocrite. Those individuals cared more for animals than they did for men. And Jesus was pointing out to them, hey, a human being is of much more value than an animal. You hypocrites. You can almost see why they hated Jesus, can't you? I pulled out another example. It's found in Mark, the second chapter, 27 and 28. On this particular occasion, Jesus had not healed on the Sabbath. What had happened is his disciples were walking through a field and they were pulling ears of corn off the stalks and were eating it. And immediately, the Pharisees write, Hey, this is the Sabbath day. You can't do that. That's work. And Jesus gives two more arguments about the Sabbath day. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. Now notice this last part. And the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Folks, man was not to be a slave to the Sabbath day the way the Pharisees had made them slaves. You can only walk a quarter of a mile. Now where was that found in the Lord's legislation? You can't heal on the Sabbath day. Where was that in the Lord's legislation? They had all kinds of rules and regulations and traditions they had placed upon the Sabbath day and man was enslaved to that day. And God said, that's not the way it is. And the second point that he made was this. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. If there's anybody who knows what you can and can't do on the Sabbath, guess who? It's me. I made the Sabbath day. I legislated the Sabbath day. And who are you to tell me, the Son of Man, how to observe it? That's pretty bold, isn't it? My friends, if Jesus healed on the Sabbath, it was because it was righteous and lawful to be done. How about this next one? Destroy the temple. At the trial of Jesus... There are a lot of individuals brought into those trials that were what we call false witnesses. They had all kinds of accusations that they made against the Christ. And one of them was that he had said he's going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days. I want you to think about this. If he didn't do it, that meant he was a liar, doesn't it? If he did do it, that means that he had destroyed the holy place of the Almighty God. Now at the time of Jesus' trial, the temple was still standing, wasn't it? What was their point? He didn't do it. He must be a what? He must be a liar. And if he is a liar, guess what? He is not the Messiah. He is not the Son of the living God. But we all know the answer, don't we? The answer lies in the definition of the word temple. Jesus was never talking about the physical temple in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus was talking about the temple of His body. 
And the Bible tells us that plainly. But he spake of the temple of his body. And guess what? Jesus did destroy that temple, didn't he? It was destroyed upon the cross of Calvary when he allowed himself to be arrested and nailed there in the presence of all of those Jews. That body came to an end, didn't it? And died around 3 o'clock. And he rebuilt it in three days. On that Sunday, he burst forth from the Hadean realm, victorious over death, did he not? Destroy this temple, and he did. Rebuild it in three days, and he did. It's all about what? Definitions. And folks, there's a lesson there. We have words in our language, in other languages, that have more than what? One meaning. And here's something that we need to realize. Anytime we get into a discussion with any person, we better make dead certain that we come to an understanding of the definitions attached to the words that are being used. If you've ever picked up a debate book and you read it, the very first thing those individuals do when they stand in that pulpit, they define the words of the proposition. If you and I aren't talking about the same thing, then guess what? You and I are not on the same page, are we? They said, what? The physical temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said, no, the temple of my body. Two different temples being talked about. So they're arguing about two different aspects. Now here's what's interesting. What if I were to stand up here in the pulpit and say something like this? Man, last week... When I preached that lesson, I was just inspired as I could be. The elders would fire me. They'd call me into the office. Come here, Vic. We need to talk to you about that statement you made. You said you was inspired last week. You ain't inspired. Well, I was inspired. I drank my monster drink. I studied my lesson hard. All the slides clicked the way they should have clicked. I didn't forget a scripture. Everything was wonderful. I was just inspired as I can be. Their definition of inspired is what? Divinely inspired with the Holy Spirit of God. I didn't say that. I just said I was inspired. Two different what? Two different words. We've got to get on the same page with our words. Folks, that's why it's important when individuals come to your door and you're talking to them, you've got to get the definitions right. If it's a Jehovah's Witness standing there, if it's a Mormon standing there, and you ask them, is Jesus the Son of God? They'll say yes. And you'll think, they think like you think. No, they don't. No, they don't. They both believe that Jesus Christ was a human being. He was a created being. The Mormons are very interesting. They believe that he was just as human as we are at one time and he evolved into a God. And that each one of us can do the same thing and become little sons of God as well. Two totally different ideas. You see, they misunderstood Jesus' words and then made false accusations about him in a court and tried to condemn him to death because of it. That's sad, isn't it? There are many individuals who make false accusations against Jesus in order to claim that he was a sinner. Notice this. This is the real problem with accusations. Is we've got individuals in our world who the minute they hear something, they immediately believe that is fact. Don't they? No matter what is said. They don't investigate, they don't look, they don't study, they don't read, they don't try to see what really was going on. They just believe whatever is fact. Jesus was a sinner. He created crimes. He beat people. He had all kinds of anger issues. He healed on the Sabbath and violated this, and everybody just believes it. They never study. They never try to find out what the true answers are. We have a gullible population that will believe just about anything. My friends, 
our responsibility is to learn the facts and the truth. You know that? Did Jesus get angry? Oh, yes. But not sinful anger. It was righteous indignation because of sin in the temple. Did he heal on the Sabbath day? Yes. But acts of mercy were permitted on the Sabbath day. Did our Lord say He would destroy the temple and build it in three days? Yes, and He did. The temple of His body. You see, once we understand what the truth is, she has a whole lot of difference on the situation, doesn't it? The reality is this. The charges against Jesus that individuals make are false, they're trite, they're outlandish, or they're all three. And the point that we want you to understand is this. You and me, as children of God, can affirm without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the sinless Son of the Almighty God. And my friends, if He isn't, we don't need to be here. And next week, that's what we're going to be talking about. The purposes of Jesus' sinless life. I'm glad we have a sinless Savior, aren't you? I'm glad I don't have to put my trust in some old sinful man, some man who's just about as sinful as I am. What good would that do? Do you believe in the Christ? Do you need the salvation that He's offering? It's simple to obtain, isn't it? Repent of sins, confess His beautiful name. And be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Dear Christian, do you live for Jesus the way you ought to live? Maybe you've sinned. Maybe you've transgressed the will of God and you need forgiveness. Do you need to respond to this invitation? Won't you come as together we stand and sing?